When Tesla began producing the Model S electric car back in 2012, I remember attending the launch event and then excitedly running back to my hotel room to file a report for Green Car Reports detailing Tesla's just announced fast charging standard, aka the supercharger. Back then, while we already had Chidemo charging in the wild, the Mitsubishi Aimeev was the first mass-produced EV to make use of the standard in 2009 and was followed a year later by the Nissan LEAF, CCS, Type 1 for North America and Type 2 in Europe, having been agreed upon a year earlier in 2011, was still preparing for its debut around the same time in a range of electric vehicles made by both North American and European automakers. But Tesla's supercharger design, both its small charge inlet for North America and the way its charging stations were built using multiple low-cost charging modules stacked in parallel to provide high current charging, were unlike anything we'd seen in the industry before. And for the last decade, Tesla's supercharger network and charging plug has been exclusively a Tesla thing. Now, though, that's changing, with the last month and a half seeing a rush of automakers, charging station manufacturers and charging networks announcing their transition from the current standard CCS Type 1 in North America to the Tesla Supercharger Inlet, something which is being called the North American Charging Standard or NAX, even though technically it's not yet officially a ratified standard, although that is soon about to change, we're told. Today, we're going to talk about how the transition to NAX will affect you as a new EV customer, an existing EV customer, and what you should look for in terms of rollout. Let's get stuck in. In just a few short weeks, NAX has quickly become the new hotness in the EV charging industry, at least in North America and Korea. Unlike Europe, where CCS Type 2 has been the mandated standard now for many years, and even Tesla supercharger stations there use CCS Type 2, Markets that have traditionally used CCS Type 1 are now preparing to switch to NAX, with Ford, GM, Rivian, Mercedes-Benz and many, many more all jumping onto the NAX train. We know that if you buy a new car from 2024 onwards, you'll get a CCS Type 2 to NAX adapter with your vehicle. From 2025, most new models will ship with Tesla's NAX inlet in addition to or in place of CCS Type 1. Tesla is already said to be working with automakers to ensure that they have access to appropriate adapters, and automakers are expected to integrate payment details into their own in-car systems so that rocking up and charging should be completely seamless from the end user perspective. We also know that Tesla intends to not charge customers a premium to use Tesla's supercharger network. As I understand it right now, supercharger networks will charge non-Teslas the exact same as Teslas to charge. Although Tesla has no plans to charge non-Tesla customers extra though, it's not 100% clear if automakers will be allowed to tack on extra fees, fees to cover things like back-end communications, for example. Either way, though, if you're going to be driving a new non-Tesla EV and it has over-the-air software update compatibility, the chances are everything will be fully integrated into your car when it comes to charging setup and initiation at Tesla's supercharger network. And of course, once 2025 rocks around, it's hoped that other charging providers will be full steam ahead with adding NAX to their existing and new locations. Although it's also worth noting that isn't going to be super straightforward. And as I'll come to later, the transition may take a while. What about people who buy a car in the next year or someone who's just purchased a recently launched EV that doesn't have NAX? The chances are, if you're the car's only and first owner, you'll probably have a pretty seamless transition to NAX from CCS. You'll probably be given an adapter. Right now, we know Tesla is likely to work with automakers on developing an adapter for CCS cars to use. I mean, it already has the hardware ready to go in its magic dock. 
But while automakers who are signing on to NAX are pretty much uniform in their pledge to give new customers an adapter as soon as they're ready, it's not clear with every automaker for existing customers who will pay when adapters are available. It's even less clear for owners of older EVs that make use of CCS. Think first generation Ford Focus EVs, Chevrolet Spark EVs, Chevrolet Bolt EVs and many more. In those use cases, I think it is, frankly, highly unlikely that respective automakers will pay for an adapter to be given to whoever the registered owner currently is free of charge. And there's also some question as to if those very early CCS vehicles will actually work with NAX or not, especially since most of those cars lack the onboard hardware required for plug and charge. As we've detailed before on this channel, link just about here, there's a plethora of different communication protocols and standards that are sent over the physical connector that is CCS, and I think it's going to be a tall order to get every single EV that uses CCS working with NAX. Early anecdotal evidence suggests that even at Tesla superchargers, where magic docks are being used, there are already some teething problems with certain makes and models of EV. Another thing we're going to have to address here is the question of adapters and just how automakers and charging providers respond to people using them. Currently, most charging networks in North America frown on the idea of charging adapters. And while some publicly state they're not to be used, but then tend to turn a blind eye to them, I fully expect a future where only fully tested and approved charging adapters are allowed to give CCS compatible cars NAX capabilities. And if you're not using one, you could be in trouble. And if this happens, and the cost of official charging adapters is more than a few hundred dollars, this will cause problems, especially if automakers follow Tesla's lead and only sell adapters to registered owners of cars that require them. If you're not already sure, Tesla will only sell you a CCS1 adapter for a Tesla if you own a compatible car. Bottom line then, if you own an older EV with CCS and you want NAX compatibility, it might make sense to start saving for an adapter now. And you should also expect some extra hoops, like going through smartphone apps, to be able to charge at NAX stations. I also expect some networks to only give support to those who are using approved cars and approved adapters. And if you try to use an unapproved one, you will most definitely been on your own if things go wrong and you could end up finding yourself banned from the network with an expensive repair bill if things don't go right. So what about those with older Chidemo cars in North America? In an ideal world, I'd love to see a Chidemo adapter, but I doubt that's going to happen. Mitsubishi doesn't make the iMeve anymore and frankly doesn't have a lot of interest in keeping them on the road, relegating them to enthusiast status. Nissan may still make and sell the Leaf with Chidemo connectors, but unless I am very much mistaken, I don't see a NAX adapter anytime soon. Although Tesla at one point offered Chidemo connectors for older Model S and X models, that was before it switched over to its latest NAX protocol, which is much more closely aligned with CCS than Chidemo. In other words, to build a Chidemo to NAX connector wouldn't just be a physical plug, you'd have a fair amount of internal electronics required to convert from the power line communication used in CCS and the current version of NAX to the CAN bus based communication protocol used by Chidemo. But stop a second, because while on paper it might sound like Chidemo cars and early CCS cars are doomed, it's important to remember that the majority of EV owners don't fast charge every day. Many don't use it at all. And those of us who do fast charge likely only really use it when we're making long distance road trips. Statistically speaking, most Americans don't road trip all that much. And given that the annual average mileage of most cars in North America is between 10 and 15,000 miles in most states with only super rural states like Wyoming or Missouri accounting for more miles per year, rapid charging is likely a two to three times per year occurrence. 
For owners of older cars that may not be compatible with Nex, the chances are they can just carry on using their cars as they currently do and maybe find themselves renting for that once in a blue moon road trip. That is, assuming they have access to off-street parking and charging at night, which not everybody does, but we're told more level two charging stations are on the way. Sure, this might make your car less appealing on the used car market, but the day-to-day -day functionality should remain pretty much the same as it is today, NAX or not. Vehicle ownership aside, let's also not forget that this transition to NAX will take a long time. Even with maximum cooperation from all sides, there's going to be hiccups and there's going to be a lot of money that will need to be spent to make the transition complete. While Tesla's supercharger network is by far the most reliable charging network out there today, it's that way because Tesla controls every aspect of the experience from the engineering and design of charging stations and cars through to the software implementation, communications between cars and charging stations. And even though the network is reliable and the experience generally great, opening that up to third parties will bring headaches as we've said in several previous videos on the subject. The more cars and more charging station manufacturers and operators that operate on a particular charging standard, the more hiccups there will be. And I think we'd be disingenuous to ignore the fact that existing CCS type one charging infrastructure is in part so unreliable because of the sheer number of different manufacturers and charging providers offering it. Not to mention the uncomfortable truth that many charging station companies simply don't keep their technicians properly furnished with replacement parts. For example, last year, when we were on the road, we encountered a technician working for one of the largest charging networks in North America. They had driven a good 50 miles to a location with a broken charging station to diagnose a problem. They knew they didn't have the equipment they needed to fix the problem and pretty much knew what the issue was before they arrived. But until they'd actually visited the location and confirmed the error was what they said it was going to be, they weren't actually authorized to order and pick up the replacement part. That, that kind of bureaucratic stupidity is going to continue to exist even if everyone switches to NAX. That's a people and a management problem, not a charging connector and protocol problem. Expecting that to change overnight with the adoption of NAX is like expecting a restaurant to change its terrible reputation just because Gordon Ramsay and a film crew swooped in to fix things. If you need more proof that it's not going to be an overnight transition, look at the adoption of 800 volt charging technology. It was... 2019, when the first 800 volt compatible cars, the Porsche Taycan, started to roll off the production line. Four years later, and not every charging location is compatible with 800 volt cars, and not every 400 volt charging station can happily charge 800 volt cars at a lower power level compatible with the relevant architecture. Simply put, all the charging stations that are already flaky in their support may just end up getting abandoned by charging providers, something we've seen in the past with charging corridors such as the West Coast Electric Highway up the US West Coast. When it was installed and funding was available, the charging stations, mainly Chidemo, were well supported and reasonably reliable. But when funding started to dry up, there were a few years of pretty horrid customer support and reliability before things were fixed. And I'm going to expect the same with the transition to Nax. And while there may be nearby Tesla superchargers, they may be too far apart for older CCS compatible cars to use, even if they have a charging adapter. Finally, let's talk about home charging. How will this transition force you to change your charging station at home? Well, luckily, it won't. Charging at a level one or level two J1772 charging station should just require you to buy a Tesla adapter to use a NAX car on a J1772 station and vice versa. We've been using Tesla taps for years at the channel and many EV owners have been doing the same. The transition is coming and it hopefully will make it easier for everyone. 
But in the interim, we need to be prepared for some hiccups along the way. And on that note, we are done with today's video. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room on Mastodon, or if you are a Patreon supporter in the comments section there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell and follow the links below to regularly supporters of the YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. And you'll also find links to our Kofi Bitcoin and swag store, as well as that aforementioned Mastodon server. Scrolling on my right is a list of amazing charged up supporters and shout outs go out to our V2G Patreon supporters, Alan Tapper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Esker, John Tramal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Raging Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tesla in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Centaur, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlal, Linda Irish, Mike Reader, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Neck, Joe Brisney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. And if your name is not on any of those lists, we need to make an updated list and we haven't managed to get around to it yet. I am sorry, but that doesn't mean we are not grateful for your support. Thank you. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday on this channel. Plus on a Sunday, you will find us over on Transport Evolve Take Two for our chicken and garden update and our Sunday musing. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. So you might've noticed today that the classic mech behind me was not on. That is because this G4 cube has decided to blow its hard drive up. I tried turning it on for filming and it was stuck in a boot loop. It does work, I, I promise, uh, but I have an SSD that I need to take out of its packet and put in there and remove the spinning iron that's in there because it's clearly not very happy. Then I'll put uh, probably Sorbet Leopard on it, which is the standard go-to if you want OS X, and I'll probably put uh, Mac OS 9 on it as well. And some of you have actually reached out with cubes and said, hey, would you like some spare parts? I would love some spare parts. I know some of you have already reached out and I have misplaced those emails. So please do reach out again. I'm sorry.